Doctors. Hello, welcome podcast. back to the Black Doctors Podcast. I am Stephen, your host. By training, I'm an anesthesiologist and critical care medicine physician. I have a passion for medical ethics and did some additional training in that field. And I've been running this podcast for just over three years now with the goal of inspiring the next generation. Thanks so much for joining every week. It's been a, a really good run. I, I've kind of finished fellowship and I'm at a point in my career where I, I have a little bit more time to dedicate to the podcast. And hopefully that's kind of apparent in the quality of the episodes and the quality of the guest and the discussions and content that is a part of the show. In the last couple of weeks alone, last week's guest, Dr. Jade Norris, she is a concierge physician, direct primary care practicing in Las Vegas. She was on kind of sharing her practice. I really enjoy highlighting, especially the primary care specialties. You know, they're, they're so neglected. They're not quote unquote sexy, but they really do so much for vulnerable populations. They are kind of the, the glue that holds our communities together and they're essential and they really need to be highlighted. I love to highlight the different styles and formats of practice patterns that you can have. The, the sky's the limit. You can do a lot of unique things. You can be your own boss with primary care. So I love having primary care physicians on and share the, the things that they do. Before that, I think it was Dr. Stephen Estime, anesthesiologist. It's ERAS season, right? So shout out to you medical students that have submitted your ERAS. I remember back in 2013, going to 2014, when I was applying to residency, definitely a very stressful time. But you're there, you've made it this far. If you're a third year medical student or you know it's in the future for you, watch, learn, take notes from your classmates that are in this position. Just hang in there. You're, you're so close to the finish line. You're going to keep on doing the work and you, everything's going to work out just fine. To that end, for those folks that are applying, we had at least two episodes, one with Dr. Stephen Estime, he's the anesthesiologist and assistant program director for an anesthesia residency. We had Dr. Anthony Douglas, who is a general surgery resident, and they both had really good conversations on the podcast about how to be a competitive applicant, how to interview well. So definitely go back and check out those episodes. They were within the last month. So it was really easy to find. And I'll put a link in the show notes as well. And a, a year ago, it's also time for folks that are finishing up their residency training or finishing up their fellowship to start looking at jobs, start sending out applications, to start setting up interviews. Just over a year ago, when I myself was in this process, I recorded an episode with Dr. Michael, well, not doctor, he's a, a lawyer, Michael Johnson. He has his own law firm. He specializes in physician contracting, and he was very helpful for me in my process. It was probably one of the better interviews or more helpful interviews that I've held on the podcast. I've referred it to many friends. They've all found it very helpful. And specifically for you, if you are about to or in the middle of applying for a job. When do you need a lawyer? What do you need a lawyer for? How can you set yourself up to successfully find that job? So definitely go back. I'll put another link for that in the show notes so you can have all these episodes that are very, very helpful. Turn over a new leaf of the podcast. I have notes, something that I, I usually don't use, but I have actually put a fair amount of thought into the topic for today's podcast episode. I'm going to be talking about choosing yourself throughout your medical career. And shout out to Nate Jones, my co-host. He's featured on quite a few episodes, and there's going to be an episode, I think, next week with Dr. Nate Jones and Dr. Bianca Bush. She's the college psychiatrist, and they're going to be talking about, I believe it's anxiety. We're going to try to have a, a recurring theme of mental health on the podcast. And Dr. Bush, she is a child and adolescent psychiatrist and focuses on mostly college students, but she's just a wealth of information as physicians. You know, we can all learn and, and help focus and improve our mental health. But I'll give you a break from my voice, but probably next week, I think I'll get that ed edited and uploaded. So looking forward to that. So we're going to jump into today's episode. There's a lot of stuff going on in med Twitter per usual. It's a dumpster fire or med X, I guess. Now that it's, it's got a new name. 
but I think I'm going to skip some of those highlights. Nothing super juicy. There's some good stuff per usual, but it's just kind of more messy. So I'm going to talk today kind of about how I have chosen myself throughout my medical career, for better, for worse, the way that has helped me. And I think overall, it's helped me mitigate burnout. It's helped me maintain some semblance of work-life balance. If you are deciding on a career in medicine, if you're in a career in medicine, it's no surprise that medicine can take a lot from you. It takes a lot from us to get into this career. The physician burnout rates are incredible. You know, some numbers as high as 60%. Of course, it depends on how they're actually quantifying or defining burnout. Now that it's kind of a, a sexy topic in the literature, there's always grading scales and all this stuff. And you can fill out a survey and it's like, oh, does your job bring you pleasure when you come into work every day? Which, you know, most jobs probably don't. But there you go. You're burnt out. So to a varying degree or varying degrees, we are all afflicted by burnout in some way, shape, or form. If you are in medical school, gosh, we know it is a, a terrible trying time. Residency, horrible. You're hitting your 80-hour work weeks. You're stressed about evaluations and training exams, golden weekends, whatever the case. If you're practicing medicine, you know, there's a whole new set of stressors that you probably didn't even realize were out there until you got that first attending job. So how do you choose yourself? How do you navigate these conflicting goals and conflicting priorities? You have to be intentional about choosing yourself in medicine. And that's easier said than done, right? People say, oh, just pick yourself. But the way I look at it, there's times and places that you can choose yourself. When you're in the middle of ERAS applications and you're writing personal statements and you're signing up for all these, you know, transportation to interviews, although I guess they're mostly virtual these days, it's hard to choose yourself. There's something that is a higher priority. It's getting in front of those interviewers. It's interviewing well. It's matching to residency because that's the reason that you're here, right? But I think we get off on the wrong foot from the very beginning. When we decided to go into medicine, you know, we chose to help people, right? That's what ends up on everybody's personal statement. Our goal, like the admissions process for medical school has stripped us of any ulterior motive or even of our, our own like humanity. It has to be altruistic. We are here for other people to the detriment of our own lives. We're sacrificing everything to serve patients. And that's kind of there. So looking back on how or your why for going into medicine oftentimes sets us up for this burnout inducing career. Full disclosure, this is something, you know, I've said it a couple times. I hope it doesn't go viral in a bad way, you know, because there's good viral, bad viral. When I was applying for medical school, when I was sitting down and thinking about my career or what I, I want to do in life, I was really looking at it as a business decision. My goal was not to be rich. I was a music major at the time. I had done some construction work at a hospital. That was my first exposure to medicine. That's a whole other story for another episode. But as I sat down and thought about what should I be, I could finish my music degree. I could be a music teacher. I could work construction. I thought, you know, if I wanted to raise a family, it'd be pretty tough to, to raise a family on a music teacher's salary. You're kind of, you know, could be living from paycheck to paycheck. I wasn't good enough to be a professional musician. What could I do? What would give me a steady income, a steady paycheck? After I was exposed to working in the hospital and physicians, and, and I was like, you know, should I be a nurse? Should I be, try to be a doctor? I don't know if I'm smart enough to be a doctor. I don't know any physicians. And I was navigating all of these issues and struggling. But the one thing that I thought to myself, hey, you know, physicians aren't broke. They're always going to have a steady income. My goal at that time was to make $200,000 a year. And it wasn't that, you know, the $200,000 a year was, I didn't want to be rich. I, I just figured I would be able to live a very comfortable lifestyle. I'd be able to raise a family, support kids, and, you know, being a physician in medical school is very challenging, and I thought it would be an interesting career path. So that was my why. Now, that's definitely not what I put in my personal statement. You know, it was the typical things about wanting to help people, which I, you know, I do. I do. I enjoy helping other people. But I, I, I submitted a very well-written, 
personal statement that was more akin to what people wanted to hear. And throughout that, I've, I've always kind of lived this duality of, you know, people are going to find out why I'm really here and feeling guilty, even though, again, I really enjoy being able to help people. Personally, I try to, to do my best clinically out of a sense of professionalism versus a sense of duty or, or, or a passion for medicine because passions burn out. You have patients that are difficult to work with for lack of a, a better word. And, and that passion can burn and fade. Whereas for me, anyways, professionalism is something that's there. I can get up, I can deal with a difficult patient. I'm getting up at six o'clock in the morning, even though I hate mornings because I, it, it's part of the job that I signed up to do. I'm professional. So your how and why for coming into medicine can really shape the rest of your career. When you put in that personal statement and you believed to your core that you are here to help other people to the detriment of yourself, like that's something that you, you filed away, you tucked in back when you were a junior or a senior in college, filling out your, your AMCAS application. And that went with you as you applied to medical schools and went through medical school and, and on to residency and to your career. So how you get there is, you know, or what do I say? Uh, how you get them is how you keep them. I think it's used to like that phrase is for immorality or like dating. How you get them is how you keep them. But it's true for medicine. So we sacrificed everything to get here and we continue to sacrifice. So changing that mindset and realizing that, hey, it's okay to choose myself, to prioritize myself, that doesn't mean that I am not choosing my patients or not choosing to provide the best medicine. It's, it's protecting your own mental health, building your own work-life balance and maintaining that. So I mentioned earlier, there's times and there's places where you can or cannot choose yourself. So you got to use what you got to get what you want. You know, when you're in medical school, I want to do a very competitive specialty. You're going to look, look around, you're going to have advisors, counselors, people are going to say, hey, you need these board scores, you need this amount of research, you need to do X, Y, Z to get to that very competitive specialty. Or if it's, a, you know, a, a less competitive specialty at a very competitive program, there's different goals that you need to achieve. And that's going to reflect upon how hard you're working in medical school. I did a master's program before I applied to medical schools, and it was a master's of anatomy. So I was fortunate in that during medical school, I'd already done a medical school's anatomy course. So I had the ability to kind of kick back, relax, and not be as stressed during our anatomy class as a first year medical student. So that for me, built in a little bit of work life balance, I was a little less stressed in that regard. Now the other courses, you know, it was medical school, and it was tough, but it was nice that I had that that outlet that, hey, I, I, I'm not seeing this stuff for the first time. I had a little bit of an advantage and I was able to, to relax a little bit. I realized, you know, I'm not an A student. I am a B plus, B minus student. And those are the grades that I got. You know, for me in medical school, working that hard to get A's to honor everything would have sacrificed too much on my personal side. You know, does that manifest later in, okay, I'm really stressed about applying to residency because I didn't honor everything? Absolutely. But at that time, at that place, I was a solid, you know, B student or I passed everything. And throughout medical school, I chose myself. Like looking back, you know, at the time, it was just doing what I like to do. I played piano and bass guitar for my local church. And during medical school, I would play two two weekends a month. And on those weekends I would play, it would be, I think we had three morning services and one evening service. And so two weekends out of the month, you know, I'm in church all day playing with the worship team. And that also meant, you know, once a week I am practicing with the group. So that was, you know, what took up the rest of my study time. If I hadn't done that, maybe I would have been honoring courses, but for my sanity, it was just a release. And I didn't really think about it as I need this to relax. It was just like natural. And it was so fulfilling and so worth it to take that time for me 
during medical school. I like to provide actionable tips, recommendations, information. One of the best ways that I chose myself in medical school, it's probably a little late for the current fourth years, but I had done my master's program in Tampa at a U University of South Florida. I had some friends that lived down there. So what I recommend for every fourth year medical student is to apply for an away rotation someplace that is just fun, whether that's going back to your hometown, whether it's Hawaii. This was Tampa, Florida in, I think, January or February. And, you know, I did a radiology away rotation. I did a radiology away rotation. I was, you know, applying for anesthesiology, but I took a month. I went and hung out, slept on my buddy Ruan's couch. And, you know, because I didn't have the money to pay for a place to stay, but I had people down there. So I went to Tampa. I hung out for the month. I got to hang out with friends. It was just a super low stress. So that, you know, it was a win-win. And I just recommend, you know, whatever it is, something fun, something that's low stress, just to, to get a little break. I always try to see what everybody else is doing. And there's the standard progression of which courses you take, which electives you're doing in medical school. And I, I would always think to myself, you know, what can I do? So that is one of the tips that I, I recommend that everybody do. And then, you know, you work hard, you party hard. I've got so many great memories from being at Howard. We worked really hard. We would have, I think the way our schedule was set up, every two weeks we had an exam. So on the weekends, we were either right before a test or like in the middle between. So it was kind of hard to find a weekend to, to party. But uh, believe you me, we definitely worked that out. So you got to do what you got to do to maintain your mental health. The words of uh, Fleetwood Mac, you can go your own way. Yeah, find your own way and roll with it. Fast forwarding on to residency and looking back, how did I choose myself for residency? Residency was tough. It was a big adjustment. I've talked about that in other podcast episodes. I think for everybody starting intern year, you're moving to a new city. It could be a culture shock. It, you're, you're facing discrimination potentially you're, you're facing inadequacies that you didn't even know you had you see people that, that are spitting out data i remember as an intern you know i'm not the strongest medicine person right because i'm just going into anesthesia i remember my, my co-intern pat harkins he was a anesthesia intern with me and i was taking over the medicine service from him he was rotating off i was rotating on and he started talking about like delta delta gaps and i'm like what the heck is that i've never even heard of that there are so many things I'm like, I, I just never, like, did I take the same or the right medical school courses? So intern year can be rough. It's challenging. Work hard. It's one of those times that you may not be able to choose yourself as much as you might have otherwise. It I, For me, life comes in seasons. So I, you know, had some hiccups down the road as an intern. I worked hard to make up for those. So I was just, you know, doubling down, trying to fight for my survival. Fast forward to CA one year, your first year doing anesthesia. Those first six months are just like drinking out of a fire fire hydrant or a fire hose, whatever the, the the phrase is. It's a lot going on, but if you make it through, by six months in, you kind of catch your stride. Life's good. Your CA two year, you start rotating through different subspecialties. So again, it's a lot of hiccups, and you're working hard. As I was in the middle of CA two year or probably is between like CA2, CA3 year. I had two things that happened that forced me to choose myself. In retrospect, you know, if depression, if there was ever a time, like not realizing that that's what I was suffering from, like I was probably at risk for it. The two things that happened, I lost two friends that just passed away. They didn't wake up one day. One was a intern in a different program working at my hospital and about a month later one of my friends from Howard that was at a different program passed away so within the span of about a month two people that were young younger than me a, a, a year or two younger we were all in our prime of life we'd all made it we'd matched into incredible residency programs we were working so hard and all of a sudden they were, they were both gone. And, you know, it was a, a realization and an eye opener for me 
that, you know, their their parents, everybody was so proud of them. They'd done so much. They'd accomplished so much. They were doing all of the right things. And all of a sudden, they're gone. And, and I realized, you know, what am I working so hard for that when this could all be over at any point in time, I have to take time for myself. And because I had worked so hard the, the previous, you know, two years, three years, whatever, I had a bit of a social capital at the program. They knew I worked hard. I'd done okay academically. And I just checked out. I checked out a residency for a month, almost two months. Didn't read a book, didn't study. I did enough to provide safe patient care, but I was just kind of on cruise control. I, I have pictures. And that's when I remodeled my kitchen for my friends that are listening. They know I have a, a condo in the South Side of Chicago, which is actually for sale. If anybody wants a, a condo in Bronzeville, it's either here nor there. And I pulled out the cabinets. I pulled up the tile floor. I poured concrete countertops in my living room. And I did a not a full rehab, but it took almost two and a half, three months to completely redo my kitchen. And, and now you know, the reason I was redoing my kitchen was because I was in a really bad place. and I needed to just take a break and check out. And that's just what I did. At the end of that process, I was in a better spot. I'd done something for me. And so, you know, there's going to be times, there's going to be seasons in your life where you're just in the trenches, you're working hard. There's going to be some seasons where you're going to need to stop and take a break. You're going to take your foot off the gas pedal and just cruise for a little bit. And, you know, that's okay. You have to choose yourself in medicine. This is the only life that you get. Your family members are are there. And again, we sacrifice so much for this career. I'll probably wrap up. Like the, the, the last example I'll give of choosing myself was with, it came down to the wire. I was you know, going to my third year residency. On the one hand, I was like, I should apply to be a chief resident. That would be cool. Pretty well liked. People know me, you know, get a, a black chief resident at this program. That'd be cool. Representation. Rah, rah. The other thing I, I really liked, though, was medical ethics. And the University of Chicago has a one-year fellowship. It runs concurrently with your with your ACGME accredited training. So it's not an extra year. It's just kind of current with whatever year you are in in residency. And, you know, I knew I could do one or the other. So I, I talked to one of my mentors, Dr. Blair. She's an ear, nose, and throat surgeon at University of Chicago fantastic woman. And she was like, Hey, you know, people don't really remember, uh, but you were, but long-term it doesn't do that much for your career. She knows going into the military. She's like, if you do this extra training, this fellowship, it will help you promote faster. It'll give you a new aspect of your clinical career. And that's exactly what I did. I did this ethics fellowship and, you know, choosing Myself, they're, they're, and I said it because in, in academic medicine, it's so easy to get caught up in the academic world. What's going to help you promote chief resident? That sounds awesome, but realize, you know, what is the best thing for you? And sometimes you'll need that extra perspective from mentors, people that are years ahead of you to tell you, hey, in the real world or in 15, 20 years, this is a different perspective. So thanks to her mentorship and guidance, I was able to choose this ethics fellowship, which has really uh, helped me build this other niche to my career and this open doors that being a chief resident would not have opened. So again, there's times to, to choose you and there's times, you know, we, we leave all that behind and we just are in the trenches delivering the best patient care possible. While we're sharing life hacks and talking about things that I think contribute to burnout, I'll throw this fuel in the fire. I think super specialization contributes significantly to burnout. I think being in academic medicine where you're at a tertiary medical center and there's double and triple board certified people, there is a, you know, derm pathologist, oncologist, something, you know, all these crazy subspecialties. As a medical student, you're looking at that and you're like, oh yeah, that's cool. I definitely want to do this. And for me, you know, it's about the journey it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. So I wanted to do an ICU fellowship. It's because of experiences I had at Howard. 
I wanted to work in critical care. That's why I went to anesthesiology. My path was circuitous because I signed on with the Navy for family reasons. And at the end of residency, I was unable to go straight into ICU fellowship. I actually was just on Nee Darko's podcast kind of talking about some of some of that. So I went to the Navy. I was in Virginia. I was underpaid significantly, like half my salary for four years. But, you know, it's about the journey, not the destination. Being there for those four years, I learned invaluable lessons about promotion because the military is a very kind of specific graded structure for the, for you. I realized and learned that just because something's on paper for this is how you promote, there's a whole other system. How does the boys club work? What does it actually look like? I learned that the boys club means that when you went to the Naval Academy and you show up at a military hospital, your Naval Academy buddies are like, hey, you should do this job as a CMO or, or this job. And, you know, because wherever you end up, there's going to be like departmental jobs. There's going to be you know, hospital wide jobs, but learning that people will kind of steer you into specific jobs to help you build your career. It's one of the things that I learned being in the Navy. Another thing I learned, I got to work at several different facilities, different structures. I worked with a private practice group, picking up extra shifts, moonlighting. I worked for community hospitals. I worked for a big anesthesia practice management group. So I had this variety in addition to the academic medical practice that I knew so well. Because I had this experience, I saw what critical care medicine was like at a community hospital. And, you know, for for a while there, I was the person that was transferring people out. When I was at University of Chicago, we got all the OSH bombs, outside hospital bombs or transfers, all the super complicated stuff. And now I got to be on the other side of that at at a small community hospital with like two units of blood in the cooler. And I've got a patient hemorrhaging and, and, and labor and delivery. And I've got to arrange transport and get them flown down to the level one trauma center or the tertiary referral center. So I got to see what community ICU practice was like. I was like, hey, this it doesn't, it's not that bad. Just because you're an I, ICU doc, you don't have to take care of Jehovah's Witness heart transplants or these insane, you know, cesarean deliveries on, on ECMO or LVADs, RVADs, all this super complicated stuff. I changed my perception of what critical care was and that you don't have to give your entire life. Like people think about it as super busy and and shift work and it can be, but it's also the, the quality of what you're doing when you're on shift. So anyways, it was just four years of me being able to gain additional perspective. When it came time at the end, it was like, well, you still chose, you know, did you choose yourself or did you choose chose that critical care fe- fellowship? Yes, absolutely. The reason why I did a critical care fellowship was because for anesthesia, it doesn't necessarily get you that much more money than a generalist. But what it does get is a different schedule where you're kind of a week on week off model and you have a lot more free time. For me, for the projects that I have, for the life that I want to live, that free time was very appealing. And having this fellowship would have made that possible. So I did ultimately, obviously, decide to go back to do fellowship. How did I choose myself during fellowship? So I looked at all of the options. And, you know, one, you know, I see fellowships aren't super competitive for anesthesia. I think, you know, it's probably like 30% that don't go fully matched or whatever of programs anyways. It's not super competitive, but I looked around at different programs. I interviewed at 10 programs. You know, some that I love, some fantastic programs, but ultimately went back to University of Chicago. Why did I do that? Because one, I already knew the system. I already knew the city. I knew the attendings. All my friends, you know, from that were surgery residents when I was there as a resident. You know, they were most of a lot of them were still surgery residents. Four years later, mercy, because that surgery residency and, and lab time is is insane. But then some were attendings. I had friends that were anesthesiologist attendings. You know, a lot of my old attendings were there. And so for me, I knew the education was fantastic, but I also knew that I wasn't starting over from zero. I wasn't an unknown quantity. It was a little easier to reassimilate back into that mode as a learner at a hospital that I already knew. So again, as you're sitting down looking at, at life, it would have been great to you know go to UCSF or Vanderbilt or some other big time critical care program and learn something new. But for me, it was like, hey, you know, I'm on the fence about whether I want this high-powered academic career 
versus something different. I've seen what community ICUs are like. They don't have to be that hard. You don't have to give that much of yourself in every hospital system. You just have to find something that's different. And ultimately, you know, I was fortunate to find a fantastic job opportunity with fantastic work-life balance. I'll probably have to talk about that in a different episode. It'll have been going on for about a half hour now. But I, I do hope that this perspective was helpful. I know I kind of rambled through and touched on a lot of different topics. But as I look back on my life, I think about, you know, one, I try to live my life with no regrets. There's good decisions, there's bad decisions, there's mistakes that happen that are made that you just have to live with. But I try not to look at them as regrets. That's where I was at that point in time. That's what I did. And we're just going to keep it moving forward. But there's ways that you can make your life easier along the way. And I think it's it's absolutely essential that you try to take advantage of that, especially if it will mitigate some of your risk for burnout. So what are your thoughts? You know, please feel free to, to shoot a message over on Instagram. I'm on Twitter, Stephen Bradley MD. Instagram, Stephen Bradley MD. That's where my lo-fi music goes. Hoping to start that lo-fi channel soon. Then there's the podcast Instagram at the Black Notice Podcast. Hopefully, I actually have a board exam coming up in a week. So I am studying for that. And then hopefully we'll have a lot more time to put into the podcast. So definitely appreciate your support. Tune in next week for our episode focused on mental health with Dr. Nate Jones and Dr. Bianca Bush. Thank you so much for tuning in to Black Doctors Podcast. Steven, your host, we'll catch you next week. And we're here because representation matters.